Good morning, everyone. Okay, today I will present a royal re fascination review, part one, uh, the King Rama V visit to Java. And then Bill Gluckman will, will talk about His Majesty Bati collection. Uh, in 1868, King Chulalongkorn Rama V ascended to the throne. At that, at that time, he was only 15 years old. And Zhao Freya Si Surya Wong served as regent during the early years of the king ranch. His majesty needed to prepare himself to govern his country when he, when he came of age. At first, he wanted to go to Europe to see how Western country functioned, but the regent suggested that he should go someplace closer to home, cover, governed by Europe countries, for example, Singapore and Java, British and Dutch colonies, respectively. In 1821, the king, the king embarked on his first journey abroad. He was the first king. He was the first king to leave the country in peacetime. This is a map that he went in the first trip to Java. He went to Batavia and Samarang. And, there, and, he, and this are the photos of some place that he went in Gunningsville Harmony Club, Colonel in Batavia, Downbridge. And after the, first, after the first tip on his return, he sent large bronze elephant to show his appreciation, one to Singapore and one to Jakarta or Batavia. Both can still, both can still see in, in Singapore this sculpture is now in front of the Arts Hall at the Old Parliament, and Indonesia is in front of the National Museum where it was originally placed. And here's the, here's the place that he visited in the second trip in 1896. Uh, he went to Bacteria in the, after the first trip 25 years later. The reason why he came back to Shawa again was because of his health, his positive memory of Dutch and Javanese hospitality, and his wish to see more Java and enjoy the cool climate of the mountains closest to Thailand. Unlike his first trip, in which he traveled with an all-male party, this time he brought Queen Sawapa and several ladies of the court, also His Majesty did not want to formality of the first trip visit. So this was an, an official visit, a private visit. Although there were various formal events and he was greeted and entertained by Dutch and Javanese royalty and high officials. In this time, the king and his party visit many place, places than previously uh, you will see on the uh, on the map, and here's some photo that he's taking in the second trips. This one in Botanical Garden, uh, now today we know as Bogo. And and on the left one at Mount Papandayan Wokono. Okay, I will show you the, the quick. And on his third trip to Java in 1801, and just four years after his previous trip, the purpose of His Majesty the King's third trip to Java was mainly for, for pleasure, as there were interested places such as ancient temple that the king wished to see. Unfortunately, when the royal party arrived in Bandung, uh, Prince Asadang became seriously ill that their majesty has to stay there to consult with the, 
the doctor remaining in Bandung for over a month, after, after which His Majesty was able to leave during the princess recuperation period. And for now, we will look at the reference to Batik in His Majesty's diary. In the first trip in Samarang, on April 3rd, at 10 a.m., His Majesty proceeded to visit a gunpowder factory, a hospital, an asylum, and a home industry, industry that produced Jawa, Jawanese serum. And then he went back. And on his second trip in 1896, in Garut, on June 8th, His Majesty went to Raden Atipati resident and saw the serum production proceed and tried his hand in it. Also in Garut, on June 24, in the morning, His Majesty, accompanied by the resident, went to see a market which was held twice a week. In his diary, said the market has a room, head cloths for sale, and wet wrapper, and they call sabu or sabu in Malay. In Yogyakarta, June 28, sunshine. Some Chinese came by offering their goods, and His Majesty brought some kirch and sarong with exclusive design for royalty. Uh, there are some more in another diary, say. Some of them, uh, sorry. Okay. Some of them to tie motif, except the animal figures had a wayang appearance. On 29, in Yogyakarta also, His Majesty was given a Javanese court outfit consisting of a large cape wrapper called Dodot with a parang rusak design, an undershirt white and dark blue velvet jacket, e cat trouser, and hat goluk, one from paper and one from beaver, along with a spear, a book of Ramayana, and another ancient weapon, perhaps scratch. And on July 4th in Yogyakarta, there is, there, there is this diary entry. At 1 p.m., someone delivered batik to His Majesty's order. Perhaps these were some of Chinese traders near Borobudo, just, I just mentioned. Then His Majesty went to Dutch woman's house to see the process of kai making. They used white material from Europe. The color used were only yellow, actually so got brown, blue, black, and a little bit of red, but no green, as it was only done in Pekalongan. There were about 100 workers who drew the design, boy, and dye the material. The one who draw the wax received four rupees each, and one of dye and boy received 20. 25 to 40 cents. Each piece sells for 25 guilders. The owner of this workshop also gave Her Majesty one pillow. On July 7, the Susuhunan and Pangaran Adipati Ario Manguneguro sent their families to present gift to His Majesty. And the diary said that the Susuhunan gave His Majesty a special crit with three sheets, gold, diamond, a painted, and also sword decorated with jewel in bird shape. They gave her a four gold painted batik and six plain pieces, all kind bantang to Her Majesty. Later, His Majesty showed around the Radian Antipodi workshop for various handicrafts, include kind making. One room was arranged like an exhibition hall with products on display. His Majesty brought many items and also placed an order for more. And another diary regarding the, this workshop, His Majesty brought a range of quality as examples.
and in his last trip to Java. In Bandung, June 12th, the diary said that it was still raining upon request a batik seller from Pekalongan show his goods to His Majesty. He brought a tablecloth, a sewing machine, and a sarong from Pekalongan. He said this kind of fabric foreigner thing is good quality because they use fine cotton. And most of the patterns are Euro European style, but some have Java style and some have Javanese style, and the best ones are gilded. On June 28, he's stopping at Tasik Malaga, Malaya. Around noon, the king was received by assistant resident. He then visited to a club where an exhibition of local craft of sarong and mat making, embroidery, screw pile leaf weaving, and horn utensils were displayed. People demonstrate how they were made. His Majesty bought many things from them, include one batik and two walking sticks. And in Suragata, June 30, His Majesty was escorted to see an exhibition affair to craftsmen at work, but he didn't mention what he brought. And the last, in Tuktakada, July 6, from the resident house, His Majesty went sightseeing and stopped at that strong and kind factory. The owner, the owner demonstrated the whole product process, starting from watching the white fabric to pound to get uh, the washing powder out. Then they start to draw with a wax, some using pattern below the white fabric and some no pattern, uh, freehand drawing. Then they dye in blue. After they wash the cloth with hot water to remove the wax, and then they, they dye it again to turn to purple or any color they want. Each length of kind making, which was longer than a throw, cost about 15 to 30 guilders. Local people did not use these cloths. They were too expensive. His Majesty brought some as souvenir and continue on the sightseeing trip. In addition to entry, His Majesty diaries and other records of this three visit to Java. We have many of the batik purchases on this trip, along with handwritten texts. Some of which, some, sorry, excuse me, some of which give details of course, pattern, and place of purchase. You hear more about in this in their presentation, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, before I begin, I want to thank the Royal Household Bureau and our colleagues of the Inner Court for their cooperation and kindness in making the Batik collection of King Rama V available to us for study and photography. It is not surprising that King Rama V, a very intelligent man interested in technology, art, history, culture, and crafts, would be fascinated by Batik and a mass from his three visits to Java, over 300 piece examples. That's, at least that's what we've found so far. There may have been many more. <clears throat> These have been kept in the inner court of the Grand Palace since the end of his reign in 1910, 103 years ago. In fact, this is the first public presentation of these batiks since their acquisition. As you have just heard from my colleague Ralph, there are many references to batik and batik workshops in His Majesty's diaries and other records of his visits to Java. This, because there were other scribes who were taking notes on his visits. 
This is not surprising, as he would have seen batik everywhere, and batik was everywhere, on commoners and courtiers, rich and poor, Javanese and Dutch, Indo-Europeans, Indo-Chinese, and Indo-Arabians. Not all wore hand batik, or uh, the hand-drawn batik, which was called tulis. Uh, of course, many could only afford the copper-stamped or chop batik. In the king's collection, there are batik, batiks of all qualities and from many cities. The collection contains two Dutch factory-produced imitation batik cloths, white on soft red with a paisley design, probably collected on the 1871 trip. However, the overwhelming majority of the batiks in the collection are handmade and naturally dyed. Accompanying the batiks are paper or cardboard tags, mainly written in Thai and English, but sometimes in Dutch. They give information on the name of the design and or where the piece was purchased, sometimes the price paid, and in some cases information on who, who could wear it. There are also small pieces of paper with a woman's name. We'll return to this in a moment. However, sometime in the recent past, the tags were removed from the textiles. Good for the textiles, but a bit of a problem for the researcher. We are still in the process of trying to determine if the tag assigned to a particular piece actually is the correct tag. It seems so far some are and some are not. And unfortunately, several are missing tags entirely, but then they may never have had tags. It is obviously not possible today to talk about the entire collection or even half of it in the short time allotted but I'd like to take you on a brief chronological journey based on His Majesty's visits to share with you some highlights of the collection. We still can't totally correlate the quotes in the diary with specific pieces, but we have some speculations about which pieces he may have bought from certain, at certain times. The collection as it is today <clears throat> consists mainly excuse me, of head cloths, shoulder cloths, and hip wrappers from Sumatra, the north coast of Java, West Java, and the principalities. Major batik producing centers such as Sudarkarta, Jogjakarta, Batavia, which is modern Jakarta, Samarang, Pekalongan, Cherubon, Tasak Malaya, Garut, and Banyumas are represented in the collection. Although I believe several pieces predate 1871 and were probably purchased on his first trip in that year, no piece can date later than 1901, the year of His Majesty's last visit. And there's no evidence that anything was added to the collection subsequently. One of the most famous batik entrepreneurs of the mid-19th century was Carolina Josefina von Frankemont, who ran a workshop near Samarang from 1845 to her death in 1867. Her work was very fine, her designs varied and innovative, she worked in many styles, and she was famous for a rich, fast blue-green known as Prankamont Green. Her clientele were wealthy European and Indo-European women, mainly living in Samarang, but also on the north coast, uh, while she herself was Indo-European. At approximately the same time, Mrs. Katerina van Ostrom, Van Ostrom opened a workshop also in Samarang, making batiks essentially for the same clientele as Van Frankema. Uh, both women worked in a similar style and neither signed her products. Very frustrating. At some point, Van, Van Ostrom moved to Banyumas probably before 1871, but her batiks would still be traded and sold in, Sam, in Samarang. This piece, which it, with its rich reds and deep green, could have been made by either entrepreneur Van Ostrom was known for her animal designs and Van Frankemont for her green. Both the color and, the, and style speak to a sarong made no later than 1871 and possibly earlier. Several pieces in the collection show darns or remain sewn into, tub into tubular shapes with fine hand stitches, both indications that they have been worn and thus were not new when acquired. Other pieces still have the glazing and they're clearly brand new. This and the previous piece, along with several similar examples, have no identification tags. Of course, the tags could have been lost, but their absence could also indicate that they are from the 1871 trip, as I believe the inventory system may not have been put into place until the 1896 trip, when the volume of pieces increased considerably. The colors and, the, and border at the bottom of the kapala, or the head of the cloth, on the previous piece, are, and that's, at, that's this one right here, 
And this is from a piece in the Tropen Museum attributed to um, Van Francoma, um, which may be evidence for it being from Van Francoma, but again, the, the uh, batik artists had no qualms about copying each other. Also, the fabric is 111 centimeters wide. The usual width from selvage to selvage at this time was 100 to 110 centimeters. Um, Van Frankemont was known to use wider fabric. There is another piece in the collection almost identical to the, piece, the lower piece, um, and it is 113 centimeters wide. Since His Majesty's first visit to Samarang was a scant four years after Van Frankemont's death, it is not impossible given her fame, that some examples of her work would find their way into the royal collection, either as gifts or purchases. The records of the visits do not say. So we are continuing to explore this issue. In the royal collection, there is a group of beautiful batiks that all have the same tag. The tag says, Sarong, European style, but said to be made by the Javanese in Pekalongan. We have a lot of those tags. But no prices, unfortunately. These are among the most technically perfect and visually stunning of all the pieces in the royal collection. Because they have these tags, it is likely they date from the 1896 visit. Note the elaborate floral fillings and the use of blue and red, all derived from earlier imported mordant painted uh, Indian textiles so coveted in Southeast Asia. Here's another one. There's a fragment of the um, tag, but we know from other tags that it would have said the same thing. Um, this is also from the same workshop. It has the same background. Usually pieces like this would be attributed to Lassam on the north coast, and it is possible whoever wrote the labels used the term Pekalongan as a generic term for the north coast. His Majesty never visited Pekalongan. Or perhaps these are the wrong labels. It is also possible that these pieces are from a Chinese workshop on the north coast, as by the late 19th century, they were able to produce a rich green similar to that of the earlier Prankamunk green. Note the plant growing out of a small hillock, um, a design heritage of Indian trade cloths. Also, the border here, called a bow border. Van Frankemont was famous for introducing that, but then it was quickly copied by other people. It was also taken from Indian trade cloths. This is a, um, a beautiful um, batik in red and white, um, and it has the same label, Sarong, European style, but said to be made by the Javanese in Pekalongan, and the Thai says exactly the same thing. Um, who wrote these, we don't know. Uh, the motif of a lantern on a chain is quite unusual. Um, design inspiration on the North Coast came from many sources, including Chinese porcelain and European magazines. As my colleague Ralph mentioned earlier, His Majesty's diaries for the 1896 trip describe a visit to the home of a Dutch woman who had a batik workshop in Yogyakarta. I believe that woman could have been a Miss Wilhelmina Van Lauwek Van Pabst who was born in, eight, in Java in 1856. She was very well known in both the Dutch and Javanese batik worlds. Around 1899, Van Lauwek van Pabst was asked to make a group of batik samples for the Paris World's Fair of 1900. They consist of mainly variations on court patterns, of which four are shown here. They are, as you can see, they're now in the Tropen Museum. Batiks with virtually identical patterns to those in the Van Lauwek samples are found in the Royal Collection. Unfortunately, there is no tag with this piece, but it would seem to have been purchased during His Majesty's 1896 visit and probably at the woman's home workshop in Yogyakarta. Uh, if so, this indicates that Van Lauwek sample patterns were drawn from those she was already producing. And it's virtually identical to um, one of the patterns, but we have more than one that matches. This is the second piece in the Royal Collection that also matches the Van Lauwek, Van Pabst samples. Um, and the, uh, the tag says, as you may be able to read, Sarong called Parang Sonder, made in Jogjakarta, price 25 guilders. Another piece in the collection, and it again matches the, the samples, as I said, and the cost is 25 guilders, which is exactly what His Majesty's diaries say these pieces sold for. It was very expensive. 
these were the designer clothing of the day. Okay. This is a, the tag here says, um, Sarang called Lima Rikidaton, a Jogjakarta 25 guilders. Um, this is um, the lower tag. This is W. Van Lauk Van Paps. Took me a while to decipher this. 25 guilders, and this is in Dutch. She wrote this, um, and it has the name of the um, uh, pattern, and these were transcribed directly onto the um, inventory tags. When that was done, we're not sure, probably either in 1896 or a little after 1901. Um, Actually, this is a variation on the nitik pattern, which is kind of a weave imitation pattern, um, quite popular in the in central Java. This piece has Van Lauwek's Van Van Lauwek Van Pap signature, and um, it, it, the fact that it's on a piece of paper like this, it's consistent with the information we have about how the Dutch and Indo-European batik makers signed their claws before they actually would sign them later on in wax. They would have a piece of paper they pinned to the cloth. Van Ostrom did the same thing. There are at least 10 pieces in the collection with ha which have this white piece of paper with a description in Dutch and the signature W. Van Lauwek Van Pabst. Sorry her name is so long. It's quite a mouthful. Okay. Um, there are a group of pieces that are in the central Javanese colors of blue and soga brown and combine a European style kapala with a central Javanese pattern in the badan or the kapala badan body. Okay. Um, Van Lauwek Van Paps was known to have made sarongs for Europeans living in Jogjakarta, of which there are, were about a thousand Europeans in that city at the end of the 19th century. So she had a built-in clientele. The tag says it was made in Jogjakarta and cost 20 guilders. Another example, also from the workshop of Van Lauwek Van Paps, there are many pieces with her name tag in the royal collection, which makes it likely that King Rama V did, in fact, visit her workshop. Judging from this, she ran an impressive operation. His Majesty mentions there were 100 workers in the Dutch woman's compound catering to a well-to-do clientele, mainly in European or Indo-Europeans living in the principalities, but her more traditional designs in the central Javanese format of the Kain Panjang, which does not have a kapala, the whole design is across the entire textile, may have been popular with the aristocracy of Jogjakarta, especially for weddings. They would not wear them in court, but they could wear them for other ceremonial occasions outside the court. And they certainly could afford these batiks. And probably those samples that she drew up, which have court patterns, those were probably the ones that they would wear, not these. Okay. Um, there, uh, there's a batik that has um, been published that is attributed to the Jonas workshop in Surakarta. Uh, another of the semi-independent kingdoms in the middle of Java. And note the cream-colored ground, fine lines in the background, and the detailing in the leaves. It's called the Jonas Workshop. I'm still trying to find out more information about it. Um, but there's a piece, actually there are several pieces in the royal collection that I think might be from the Jonas Workshop in Surakarta. But the tag for this piece if it's the correct tag, says Sarang called Longwanas made in Jogjakarta, 25 guilders. There are three pieces with these wavy lines in the background, but all are labeled with a, a Yogyakarta or Jogjakarta um, origin. The Jonas, work, Jonas workshop was in Surakarta. So we're obviously trying to find out more about that, but it, these look like the kinds of, they were famous for this wavy line, the, the um, Jonas workshop. Okay, let's look at a relatively large group of pieces probably purchased in 1901 when the king was in Bandung and asked for the seller of batik from Pekalongan to come and show him his goods. The vendor, Indo-Chinese or Indo-Arabian, probably looked something like this. This picture was taken later, but except maybe the fact that he, wasn't, he wouldn't be, have been wearing shoes in 1901. It was probably pretty much the same um, MO. Um, Indo-European batik entrepreneurs on the north coast use these itinerant vendors to get their batiks to places like Samarang, Bandung, and Batavia that had a concentration of wealthy Dutch and 
Indo-European buyers. They were big trading centers, that's why. There are many examples of pieces signed by Mrs. Jans, J. Jans, in the Royal Collection. Uh, this piece on the screen is one of them. Uh, she was one of the foremost batik entrepreneurs of the late 19th and early 20th century. She is also the only one on the North Coast whose mother and father were both Dutch. I'm still trying to find out the exact ethnicity of Mrs. Van Lauwek Van Pabst. Um, her brothers, or what I think are her brothers, uh, there's a painting of them, certainly are Indo-European. Um, here is a, uh, the Jan signature, J. Jans, um, that's on the piece I just showed you. Um, and this is the inventory tag. Mrs. Jans was widowed in about 1885, and for some years after that, she signed her batiks Wid Jans, Widow Jans. Um, however, about 1900, she returned to signing J. Jans, which is what you see here. Um, thus, the signature on this and related pieces in the collection corroborate a 1901 purchase date. There are about eight to 10 Jans batiks in the Royal Collection, and most of them still have their glazing. The QSM, another, another evidence that he may have bought them new directly from the Tukan, the, the vendor who was selling them. The QSMT is planning to open an exhibition. This is, by the way, a unpaid for commercial. The QSMT is planning to open an exhibition of this important royal collection of batiks in December of next year. Our goal is also to publish catalogs in English and Thai on this remarkable hidden treasure. So stay tuned. There's another example, by the way, of uh, Mrs. Jans. She loved little putty and things. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll give five minutes to have question and answer. Do you have any questions for the speakers? Oh, you're such a well-trained audience. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear the question, it was once they reverted to Western dress because it's very hot here. Um, when they were just in private, did they revert to Thai dress? And yes, I think so. Um, there are some snapshot photographs that are that look like they were actually taken more casually once you were able to move cameras out of the studio, and you do see them wearing their traditional. Um, uh, hip wrappers and breast wrappers. So yes, I think the a lot of the Western dress was specifically for public presentation and specifically for the photographer. Yes, uh, the one on the f f fourth rows. Yes. Yes. Hi. Are Hi. there any known garments worn by His Majesty outside of the royal collection here in Bangkok? Um, I do not know of any personally, do any of you, or do any of you in the audience? Okay. Uh, so far, no. Uh, not, not that, I mean, there certainly are royal garments that went to various branches of the royal family, but none that I know of that belong to the yeah, king. Yeah, yeah, tried, Pat? Um, uh, for instance, like uh, Prince Damrong uh, clothes, um, we still have large numbers of that at Wang Moradit you know, the, the, the prince's uh, palace. And many of the palaces, uh, some clothes are still kept in the families. But not But not, 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 not the king, yes. Other members of the royal family, we still have lots of those. In my family, we still have. Uh, so he never maybe gifted some of his garments when he was on his travels and they're in other royal collections? Not that we know of. Um, I, I think what you're thinking of is the parallel practice, say, of Queen Victoria where and other of the European royals where oftentimes a garment would have been given either as a gift or as a perk um, to uh, somebody who was in waiting or even to a servant. But as far as, as we are aware, I mean, garments stayed within their respective families. Thank you. Just, just one, one more question. Yes, please. Yes. Hello. Uh, we appreciate uh, the royal family, and we thank the royal family for opening up their uh, collection, their Bati collection, and we are very, very happy to see them. 
because uh, you know we haven't we didn't know about this uh, in Indonesia. So thank you very much, the, the royal family, and also Gideon Lukman. Thank you. Um, I have one question which I missed. Uh, you said that in 1896 he went to a woman in Yogyakarta. Do you recall his her her name? Because that name doesn't ring a bell with us, but right. it might be somebody that uh, uh, was was at that time very popular because we have never heard about her. But thank you for bringing this up. Sure. So this will be another area of uh, uh, research. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. There's several pieces that are known to be from her in the Tropen Museum, and one of our research trips is to go to the Tropen Museum and. Uh, work with E.T. Van Hoot, the curator there, and uh, look at the pieces and compare them to our pieces. But she was quite well known at the time, yes. and um, I'm pretty sure that's who he visited, because she obviously made top of the line batik. We would also like to welcome you to the Kraton of Jokja. We will visit it next week, but uh, yes. I'm, I'm well, sure they going. will be there. They will be very happy to hear about this. Great. Yeah, and Thank also you. they will. They might help you. Thank you. We hope Thank they will. You. and. Ralph is going next week, or yes, whenever it is, to the uh, conference. Mr. Sattler is coming with right, us. Right, yeah. and then um, we're going to come back on a research sure. trip as well. Absolutely. Very welcome, very welcome. Thank you. I look forward to coming back to Indonesia. Thank you. Well, John Guy, I want to ask the last questions. Okay. <laughs>